everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, a journalist with over two decades of experience. I started covering crypto six years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full-time. Sign up for my newsletter, where I will soon be making an announcement about pre-orders for my book, The Cryptopians, Idealism, Greed, Lies, and the Making of the First Big Cryptocurrency Craze. Head to unchainedpodcast.com and the sign up for the email newsletter is right on the homepage. Today's episode is a discussion I moderated for Paxos between Vlad Tenev, CEO of Robinhood, and Charles Cascarilla, CEO of Paxos. The discussion was titled, Why Traditional Financial Infrastructure is Broken and How We Can Fix It. It was an incredibly fun and substantive discussion on one of the biggest news stories of the year. Why the whole GameStop saga played out as it did, particularly for Robinhood, and how blockchain technology offers hope that it could be prevented in the future. We also talk crypto adoption and get into some of the intricacies of crypto trading on the Robinhood platform. Plus, we take a peek at what might be coming down the pike in terms of other traditional financial players getting into crypto. I hope you enjoy this fascinating discussion. Now, on to the show. Kuiper's dynamic market maker, DMM, is the first DeFi protocol designed to adapt to market conditions to optimize fees maximize returns, and enable extremely high capital efficiency for liquidity providers. Today's episode is sponsored by EY Blockchain. Ernst & Young is committed to supporting integration of the world's business ecosystems on the public Ethereum blockchain. The Crypto.com app lets you buy, earn, and spend crypto all in one place. Earn up to 8.5% interest on your Bitcoin and 14% interest on your stablecoins, paid weekly, Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 with the code LAURA. The link is in the description. Thanks to everyone for joining our panel, Why Traditional Financial Infrastructure is Broken and How We Can Fix It. It's quite, it's been quite the hot topic for this year. Here to discuss are Vlad Tenev, co-founder and CEO of Robinhood, and Charles Cascarella, co-founder and CEO of Paxos. Welcome, Vlad and Chad. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Good to see you both. Yeah, great to see you both too. So before we begin, I would want to get a read on the audience. And we have a poll that will kind of help us see what your background is. So for the attendees, why don't you select which of these options best applies to you and your professional background? The question is, what type of company do you work for? And the options are a fintech, an established financial services company or bank, a tech company or non-financial services tech. And then the other two options are a crypto company. Um, and lastly, just other. So if you can make your selection now, we will pull up the results. And okay, so about half come from traditional financial services or banks. And then um, fintech and other compete for the second spot at 18%. And surprisingly, actually, the smallest percentage, um, well, the smallest percentage has come from crypto companies and then tech companies that are not financial services, um, which is really interesting. Okay, so it seems like a fair number of you will have pretty good familiarity, actually, with um, some of the meteor and, um, I guess, more detail-oriented um, aspects of this discussion. Um, so why don't we just start with the riveting financial events earlier this year during the GameStop saga, which really shined a light on how the back office of capital markets really works. And at that time, as we may all recall, this was big news. Robinhood and some other platforms did stop purchases of certain stocks due to how this decades old financial plumbing works. Vlad, can you walk us through what happened that caused Robinhood to stop its customers from buying stock in GameStop and some other of the Wall Street bets companies, just as that frenzy was reaching its height? Yeah, absolutely. And do you notice uh, a lot more gray hairs since, uh, since the last <laughs> time we, we had a conversation? Um, you've, you've really been through the ringer the last few months, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I'd say it, it all started back in 2008. Um, so 2008, uh, there was a global financial crisis. Um, and in the aftermath of that, there was some legislation passed. Um, uh, a lot of people in the audience might be familiar with it. 
uh, it's called Dodd-Frank. And the, the aim of this legislation was to prevent some of the kind of systemic problems that, um, that led to the financial crisis from reoccurring in the future. So among, um, among several things that Dodd-Frank did, uh, and I've poured over uh, some of this documentation, uh, so this, the events of the last year gave me an opportunity to do that, whereas perhaps I, I wouldn't have gotten very acquainted with it. But part of it actually specified um, clearinghouse collateral deposit requirements and um, some ideas and some sort of rules behind how those should be calculated, with the idea being that uh, to contain systemic risk, uh, clearinghouse deposit requirements should be beefed up, and we should make sure that all of our financial institutions have capital around to deal with uh, unforeseen circumstances. Uh, and part of what was specified was something called the uh, uh, NSCC uh, clearing deposit requirement, which I, I won't get into the calculation, but um, essentially uh, it uses a value at risk model, um, which has a tendency to uh, to increase the deposit requirements in times of, of extra volatility. So you saw this happen in March of 2020, um, a little bit over a year ago, for example, and you saw it happen uh, also in January of this year, uh, but for very, very different reasons. Um, I think March of 2020 was um, sort of a, a systemic market shock that affected the broad markets, and you saw the major indices uh, suffer dislocations. Um, you know, 2021 was something that uh, we really hadn't seen before, where um, essentially uh, a bunch of people on social media, Wall Street bets, Reddit, um, uh, had concentrated activity in a relatively small number of names. And you saw a lot of uh, unidirectional buying activity that also had the, um, the unfortunate side effect of, of spiking deposit requirements industry-wide. And Robinhood, um, Robinhood obviously had to contend with that. And we, um, Robinhood Securities, which is our clearing broker subject to these, made the call to uh, restrict opening positions in some of the securities that were driving uh, driving up the, the high VAR deposit requirement. So it was uh, GameStop uh, being one of them, but also AMC actually uh, had an e even larger contribution. Um, so I think we can argue about whether the system worked as intended. Um, it's, it's hard to uh, suppose the counterfactual of what would have happened um, in the case that, you know, Dodd-Frank wasn't written the way it was or the VAR charge wasn't codified in this way. Um, but I, I think what's clear from my standpoint, and, and I believe uh, I'm sure Chad agrees with me, is if you look to the future and ask yourself, you know, what's the ideal situation for the financial system we're in, you look at the settlement cycle you know, it was T plus five. So it took five days to settle a trade after the trade was actually matched um, back in the 90s to the 2000s. It took about 20 years to get down to T plus three. Recently, it, it went to T plus two. Um, and, and so you kind of look at what the platonic ideal of settlement is, and uh, you have to assume it's going to be instantaneous. That's just the, 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 the only way technology and progress is going to lead us. Um, and there's a lot of things that'll happen as a result of that. Uh, one of them is it would make uh, deposit requirements obsolete to a certain extent, because you know if, if things are actually settling in real time and you have these, these transactions happen instantaneously, then th there's actually no need to control uh, some of these systemic fail to deliver or uh, settlement risks because those risks would basically uh, cease to exist. So that, that's why I became interested in the topic of settlement. Chad probably became interested in it uh, for, for slightly different reasons, probably having to do with just general progress and innovation. But uh, I think we're, we're very aligned with, with that long-term kind of platonic ideal. Yeah. And so, Chad, do you want to elaborate on that? And I was curious if you, um, you know, had the same view on what the core issues were or if you wanted to talk a little bit more about what you saw as kind of the, the root of the problem here. I'm glad I touched on a lot of good points. 
what I thought was really interesting about uh, the GameStop issue is that it did not happen during a financial crisis. Didn't happen during a pandemic. It didn't happen during any type of real exogenous event. So, you know, when we had uh, the last really big systemic crisis, Lehman Brothers failed. So everyone said, oh, well, you know, Lehman Brothers failed. Of course, there was problems in the settlement uh, system. Uh, but here, n- nobody failed. Uh, there wasn't even, you know, a fear of a failure uh, like with the pandemic. This was just, um, you know, a lot of trading that happened. And it really exposed the plumbing of the system for uh, what it is, a very antiquated and outdated system. And by the way, it was a really good system when it first started. I think it solved a lot of problems. It moved us off of paper um, and it moved us to a way of creating liquidity, but it did it in a way that didn't create um, true chain of title, true understanding of who owns what when. And so that means that you have intermediaries that are stepping in and guaranteeing trades because uh, moving from paper to electronic uh, couldn't happen in as elegant a way as we could do now with modern technology. And we've, I think, reached the end of this old way of operating. And that's what GameStop showed us. We've now reached uh, the logical endpoint here. And it's time to upgrade the system. Just like we need to upgrade our roads and our bridges and our airports. You know, we have old infrastructure all over the place. One key place we have old infrastructure is in the financial markets. And that really shouldn't exist anymore. And, and frankly, we know how to fix this, just like we know how to fix the problems with our bridges and tunnels. You just have to do it. And um, what got me interested was uh, going back to the financial crisis and seeing how the plumbing exacerbated the problems in the system. And um, that's why when I came across blockchain, I said, wow, here is a way to solve these problems and upgrade and replatform the financial system. And what I just never expected is that it would be so obvious that it needs to be done that you could have a systemic problem caused by the plumbing and uh, there would be nothing else that was going on. And that's what GameStop showed. And I think uh, Vlad is right. In the limit, we're going to get to instantaneous settlement. Um, but you don't have to necessarily get to instantaneous settlement to have huge leaps forward. And you don't even have to stop at T1. You could be at T0 settling at the end of the day or batches intraday because you know it's hard for people to upgrade their treasury systems to manage real time. Um, that's going to not be something easy to get to. But I think Vlad is right. Like Inevitably, you'll get to that point. Technology will enable it. The systems will be upgraded. Enough participants will be able to do it that it will get there. But there's so many wins to have, and I'd love to hear like what Vlad thinks. Um, you know, if you could settle T zero today with a market maker, how 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 much would that impact your business? How how helpful would that be for you guys? Because I think that is um, a key place that we can get to, and if that's not far fetched at all, um, even though it might feel like it because we're at T two, um, we've done some T zero trades. Um, our system can handle it. Uh, frankly, it can handle even faster than just doing a T zero trade at the end of the day. But um, you know, you want to have a product journey that we're all going on. But that journey can't take you know half a decade uh, to happen or a whole decade to happen. And each time you want to you know shift things by a day, it needs to happen a lot faster than that. And I think that there's ways to do it and still be backward compatible. That's really what we're trying to do. Well, yeah. So we're going to um, just dive right into all this T0 discussion. Um, but first, I want to get a bead on the audience's knowledge of equity settlement infrastructure. So here we have the second poll. Again, the audience members should choose which best applies to you. The first option is when I read T plus zero, I assume someone misspelled the word two. <laughs> Second one, I've heard of T plus zero and T plus three in reference to stock trades, but don't know what they mean. And the third option is I am familiar with how stock trades are settled and why T plus three is relevant. So if you can select which applies to you, then we can you know, kind of better speak to the level of the audience. Okay, so there's some familiarity. Um, in fact, quite a bit, 82%. Um, are familiar and only about 18% would say that they're not really familiar. Um, Okay. So, you know, we'll be sure to kind of carry along the people who are less familiar, but um, it means we can definitely dive into the details on this discussion. So um, in the Senate hearings, Vlad, you were quite clear about needing T0 settlement times, whereas Citadel um, is viewing T plus one as a more feasible goal. And that's also the goal that the DTCC is aiming to reach by 2023. 
Um, and I just wondered what your take was on that goal um, as opposed to T plus zero. Is that just something we, we don't even need to stop there at that, <laughs> at that level? Or, um, and, and, you know, do you think we're ready to just jump right into T zero settlement times? I think it's going to be challenging, you know, with, with any change like this, you have uh, different market participants, market makers, banks that are used to uh, an old way of operating. And there's obviously going to be a preference of incremental progress. Um, and um, th things are going to have to change, whether it's internal processes, um, you know, procedures, uh, technology has to be upgraded. And then there's also the unknown. What happens if we are in this world of T0? Is there going to be lots of revenue loss? Uh, would, would we lose revenue as a financial participant uh, as a result of that transition? So I think anytime there's changes like this, there's hesitancy. And so you'll see um, much more of a willingness for, for incremental change. And you know, I don't necessarily think that that's uh, a bad thing. Obviously, um, there's been um, uh, something akin to widespread agreement that T plus one is going to be an improvement over the current status quo, which is two-day settlement. And I agree with that. I think it will be uh, a big improvement. And um, I think it's important for an effort that's so fundamental uh, like this to, to make sure that all market participants are heard and we bring everyone along and uh, avoid creating new problems through the transition. But I, I am very happy that DTCC um, and SIFMA uh, recently produced a plan to get to T plus one from T plus two. Um, I don't think uh, obviously we should stop there, um, but I do think it's it's good progress. Yeah, I did want to add in actually that the DTCC did estimate that the T plus one settlement time would reduce margin collateral needed for companies like Robinhood by 41%, which obviously is significant. Um, but Chad, can you also now talk about the solution that you are working on, which I know is kind of in a limited version at the moment, but why don't you describe how that works, what that is, what your roadmap is to get that out, you know, to um, a wider number of companies and, and equities? Yeah, so uh, the way our product works is right now we're operating under a no action letter. And so that limits the amount of volume and the number of stocks that we can settle, but we're settling live trades and have been for over a year now. And uh, we have uh, three participants and we've had a fourth go live. We'll be talking about that at, at some point soon here. And we have others that are coming online. So it's exciting for us to be able to uh, be showing how this technology works. And the fact that our technology isn't limited to a particular settlement cycle. It doesn't have to be T2, it could be T1, it could be T0. And ultimately, this is a bit of a choose your own adventure. Uh, our technology is uh, very flexible. Uh, it's up to the participants uh, to find the agreement on what they want to be settling in. But I do think that it's possible to move faster than T1. It's possible to get to something like T0 and to do it at the end of the day. And that's very um, understandable path forward that we've been laying out with participants. But just as importantly, the point of the technology is not just to change settlement. There's a lot of different areas that can be improved with this technology. One of them is changing settlement timeframes, which releases capital and is more cost efficient, but also having investor protections. One of the problems with the GameStop issue was knowing how many shares were short. And this wasn't necessarily a feature of players acting nefariously. It may or may not have been, I don't know, the SEC is looking into it. But what happens is it's possible because everything is held in omnibus accounts with unclear chain of title for there to be excess shares short, uh, for there to be more share shorts in the float. Uh, but if you're using a blockchain system where you know where every single share is at all times and who the beneficial owner is at all times, you have real investor protections that don't exist today because everything's just held in one giant omnibus account at the DTC. And this is a problem and there's ways to upgrade this and create investor protections while creating um, highly liquid markets while actually being more capital and cost efficient. What's a little crazy, and, and sometimes people don't know this, is that a lot of, um, of brokers are really just not uh, having their clients trade a margin. They're having them cash trade. So they're settling with cash, but they have it in the account. They can't settle the trade for two days because that's the settlement cycle. So the broker has to put the money up 
for the trade. So these are cash funded trades and the broker is on the hook and the capital call can fluctuate wildly with depending on how much stocks are moving, but yet they have the cash sitting there. And so you have a very pro-cyclical problem going on where you're getting giant capital calls that flex from 15 billion at the NSCC to 30 billion. Huge, crazy call. I mean, who could have prepared for that? You know, no one just leaves $15 billion lying around. So you have huge capital calls that are getting pulled um, uh, in some cases, uh, not in a very transparent way. Our system, you can see all day long in real time what your margin will look like with all of your participants. So you know in real time, real time risk management, not a crazy thing to have, but it doesn't exist right now. Uh, real time risk management, you could see that the capital calls are going up, but why should you suddenly have to have $15 billion that you have to post if you're having the cash from your customer in your account and to bridge that two days? Um, and so the whole system really, I mean, should be shifted in a different way. And, uh, and that's what we're um, doing with our uh, Paxo settlement system. And right now, again, this is a no action letter. We're shifting from a no action letter. We're going to apply for a clearing agency. Um, and when we have that, we'll be able to operate um, in a regular way um, in terms of ramping to being all QCIPs, all stocks and accepting all market participants. And so that's gonna take some time, of course, but that is where we're gonna be. And you know, we're optimistically uh, hoping that will be this year. I think that's the plan for us. Um, and I think that will be a big um, a shift for the markets because now there'll be competition for the first time in settlement. All this that you said is so interesting. I actually have three different things I wanna say about that. So first is um, for people who don't listen to my show, I did a great interview with Caitlin Long of Morgan Stanley, who talked about this issue about how if you had blockchain based stocks, then things like shorting by more than 100% wouldn't happen, or that you could you could make it so that it couldn't happen. Um, so people who, you know, are interested in um, hearing about that, you should check out that episode. Um, and so Chad, I just also wanted to clarify. So for your solution, every all all of the stocks that you're trading and and that you say could be traded this way, they would have to then become blockchain based stocks. They would there would be like a tokenized version of this stock. Is that how that would work? Well, th we created backward compatibility. So um, you know, today we have a full participant account at the DTC. That's what allows us to do this. Uh, when we have a clearing agency, you know, we'll be automatically connected to the DTC and they to us. But what um, uh, is enabled by this is a backward compatibility so that if a share is tokenized and uh, someone isn't settling on our system and they're settling a regular way, we can detokenize it and it goes back. And so that's an important point. Um, we know that it's very hard for people to be able to shift processes and certainly trying to do all or nothing is not effective. So we've deliberately made it compatible so that um, participants can do some of their trading in this, in this fashion, or I should say settlement in this fashion. Um, and, uh, they can continue to use, uh, their old methodologies when they need to. And then when you were talking about how it's a little bit like a choose your own adventure type, what is the fastest that your system can handle in terms of settlement? Well, we haven't tried to, uh, do something that looked like real time growth settlement because, uh, really all participants think that's impractical for the moment. Um, but certainly intraday batches, you know, you could be done every couple hours. You could do three or four batches during the day of T0. Uh, end of day T0 is what we've um, uh, put out some uh, press releases and we've done with certain participants already. Um, so event, again, it could be faster than that, even than several batches per day. Um, I think getting to real-time growth settlements hard because you're talking about hundreds of millions of settlements. And so, that requires participants to pre-fund cash and pre-fund shares uh, so that they're in a position. And so you couldn't do that now, but imagine a world in the future where, you know, say there's a central bank digital currency, so all cash is on a blockchain, and imagine a world in which uh, all shares are on a blockchain. Well, now things suddenly look a lot different in terms of even what an exchange could look like, but also that could very well facilitate the type of treasury management that would allow real-time growth settlement. But I do think that that's, you know, clearly a ways off. That is part of the journey I was talking about that participants need to go on. You can't get there overnight, um, but you can get there, I think, faster than the pace that we're on right now. Kyber's dynamic market maker, DMM, is a game changer in DeFi, being the first protocol designed to react to market conditions 
to optimize fees while providing extremely high capital efficiency for liquidity providers. Fees are adjusted dynamically based on market conditions to maximize returns and reduce the impact of impermanent loss. Liquidity providers can customize the pricing curve to create amplified pools that greatly improve capital efficiency and reduce trade slippage. Depositing tokens to earn fees is also fast and simple, with this liquidity easily accessible by dApps, aggregators, or other users. Visit dmm.exchange now. With over 10 million users, Crypto.com is the easiest place to buy and sell over 90 cryptocurrencies. Download the Crypto.com app now and get $25 with the code LAURA. If you're a hodler, Crypto.com Earn pays industry-leading interest rates on over 30 coins, including Bitcoin, at up to 8.5% interest and up to 14% interest on your stable coins. When it's time to spend your crypto, nothing beats the Crypto.com Visa card, which pays you up to 8% back instantly and gives you 100% rebate for your Netflix, Spotify, and Amazon Prime subscriptions. There is no annual or monthly fees to worry about. Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 when using the code LAURA, L-A-U-R-A. The link is in the description. Today's episode is sponsored by EY Blockchain. Ernst & Young is committed to supporting integration of the world's business ecosystems on the public Ethereum blockchain. Join our fifth annual Blockchain Summit and Education Series on May 18th to 21st for a deep dive into zero-knowledge privacy technologies, accounting, and tax rules as well as the future of finance. Sign up and learn more at ey.com slash global blockchain summit or blockchain.ey.com. Okay, so let's, um, I want to kind of just walk through what the GameStop scenario would have looked like under these different types of conditions. So, um, you know, we can talk about T0, which is kind of the ultimate goal, but even something like you know, Chad, what you described where you could do these intraday, intraday trades or, or settlement. So, and either of you can answer this, but I was just curious, you know, in, in the case of something like this, where you just have these stocks that are going up and up and up, you know, um, you know, Vlad, I'm curious to know what would have been necessary for Robin Hood to put up in terms of collateral, um, like in a teaser environment, is it true that you wouldn't need to put up any and that what was in customers' accounts would be sufficient or, um, you know, I, yeah, I'm just kind of curious to hear how you think uh, improvements in this technology would have changed the outcome from the events this last winter. Yeah, I think I think it depends on the implementation. Um, so, you know, end of day T0 would limit the collateral to basically what can accumulate during an entire trading day. Um, so it uh, doesn't completely make the problem go away, but reduces it by a, a significant margin. If you can settle in batches um, uh, intraday, and those batches are dependent on uh, factors like uh, the size of the outstanding net buy position, so they're kind of event-based rather than time-based, uh, then I do believe that that would that would solve the problem um, effectively. And I think that there's asset classes that effectively function like this, uh, cryptocurrency markets where you're converting from fiat uh, to crypto operate basically in, in that way where there's kind of ad hoc intraday settlement, uh, which you can describe as, as T0. Um, and I think uh, the, the DeFi kind of crypto to crypto trading is a good, um, a good example of what Chad was saying earlier, what a future could look like where, um, you know, you have these stable coins that are on blockchains, you have different assets on different blockchains, and you can do these like cross chain atomic swaps that effectively approximate what real time settlement would look like. And Chad, what about you? How do you think that this world would look different? Well, I think it would be dramatically different. The way it works today, you know, if you did end of day T0, it would depend again, as Vlad said, how is it constructed? Uh, that would probably reduce margin almost all the way. Uh, because right now, you know, your margin isn't even getting uh, posted until either at the end of the day or the next day. So you imagine if you're settling by 5 p.m. on T0, you know, that's going to probably be most of what needs to be done. So you could imagine dropping from $15 billion of capital that's needed to do guarantees because you have a centralized intermediary that's guaranteeing every single trade. 
to all the participants settling amongst themselves at 5 p.m. And you just needing to hold a little bit in case someone uh, doesn't fund. Um, that's a, a huge improvement. I mean, you're probably talking 90 plus percent uh, capital savings. I'm going to guess 95%. If you did intraday batching, I think, you know, you're basically getting all the way there. And, um, you know, um, you'd still probably want to collect some margin anyways, just to be extra safe, but that's not even how the system works right now. There wasn't even a trade guarantee uh, until very recently, until the night of T1. So when we were at T3 settlement, the guarantee, trade guarantee kicked in on the night of T1. So, you know, getting to T0 uh, is far better than what the clearinghouse was ever doing. And you have to remember, the clearinghouse has never been tapped before. You had the 87 crash. You had, you know, the Asian financial crisis. You had the dot-com bust. You had night uh, capital, you know, giant uh, kind of blow up. Uh, any of these things never once tapped the, you know, obviously the financial crisis of 2008, never once tapped the clearing fund. So this is a huge amount of money that is being tracked. And it's, you know, that's a, it's a nice um, thing to have, but if it's not ever used and, you know, I I guess at some point it could be used. I don't know when it's, but it's never has been used even through what is, you know, the biggest crises of all, you know, when will it be used might as well move to a different point where we can release this capital and it won't be pro cyclical where people are getting a $15 billion capital call and it flexes from 15 billion to 30 billion. Um, instead you could sit here and be using say T zero or batches, free that capital up to be used to grow businesses, to create new products, uh, to create more trading, to create more liquidity, uh, to do all kinds of different things, invest in their businesses. Uh, you know, that would be a real win for, frankly, all of society. And so that's why this is such a big issue, because that's a lot. And by the way, that, that's just the capital on the guarantee fund. That's not the capital on settlement day. Settlement day is very long and slow. It's $30 billion to $60 billion liquidity is trapped all day long with a lien on it. So that means across Wall Street, you have somewhere like 45 billion to 90 billion to 100 billion dollars of capital liquidity tied up in settlement processes that could be really, you know, released. Where could that go? I mean, well, you could think of a lot of places uh, 100 billion dollars could uh, be better utilized if you were getting to much more efficient guaranteeing and settlement processes. It's just, you're right, it's huge inefficiencies. And so I was curious because obviously, you know, Chad, you did say that you're hoping that you're able to open this solution out to a wider group within the year. And obviously Vlad is very interested in <laughs> shorter settlement times. So what would a market look like if um, there were just certain platforms that were settling this quickly and others that were uh, settling more slowly? Like, is that would that even happen or is that possible for that to happen? Or yeah, I was just wondering, um, you know, how that would look. What I'm trying to say is if the DTCC is on this track to do T plus one and you're saying that you could potentially release this out to a larger group within the year, then, you know, what happens? Do we just have two different systems for a while or what? Yeah, I mean, you basically have a bridging mechanism. So there, there's a lending market that exists today. Uh, the lending market, um, either on dollars or shares could help bridge participants. So if some participants were settling in T0 um, and they were trading to settle on T0. And, you know, you could settle on T0, you could settle on uh, T1, you can kind of, you can put a tag in today in your trades on when you want settlement to happen. And you can make different settlement timeframes possible just with the normal process, either through um, uh, OTC trades, over-the-counter trades, uh, alternative trading system trades, or exchange trades. Uh, exchange trades right now have to be a T2. So that would be the SEC changing them. But other participants, other trades can be other timeframes. And there are other timeframes. Participants could settle on those other timeframes and they just have to reallocate the inventory to deal with the rest of the process of settling out at whatever the SEC rules allow. Again, SEC for uh, exchanges is T2. If that moved to T1 or maybe they create flexibility to T0, then all participants could have the possibility of deciding when they wanted to settle. Okay. Yeah. So it does sound like if platforms manage to get there more quickly, then that's just a huge competitive advantage. Um, you know, it would cut a lot of costs, it sounds like. Um, so we could talk about this so much more, um, but we do also have another topic to discuss, which is another big thing that's been taking off all this year, which is crypto. Uh, so when do we do the third poll? Um, because we kind of, again, want to see where the audience members are at in terms of their level of experience with this. 
Um, so for this question, it is, have you ever purchased crypto? If so, from where? And the options are, I have never purchased crypto and don't have plans to. I have never, never purchased crypto, but I'd like to. I have purchased crypto via the Robinhood app. I have purchased crypto via PayPal or Square's cash app. And then the last one is, I have purchased crypto via Coinbase, Gemini, or another crypto specific company. So go ahead and make your selection and we will see. Okay, so more than half have purchased via Coinbase, Gemini, or another crypto specific company. The second is, um, I've never purchased crypto, but I'd like to. No, sorry. The second is, I purchased crypto via Robinhood. The third is, I've never purchased crypto, but I'd like to. And then lastly, uh, PayPal, and then never purchased. Okay, so clearly, um, yeah, what we've been seeing in the news that a lot of people are getting into crypto is is um, bearing out also here the in this discussion. market share here, Vlad. 17% <laughs> market share. That's, that's pretty good. So Vlad, you were one of the first fintech apps to add crypto. Why did you move make that move um, back then before this big um, you know, interest took off in the mainstream? Yeah, we, we added crypto in early 2018, um, which at the time felt, felt somewhat late, but uh, I guess now... Uh, <laughs> Look at what's happened in in the last three years. Um, uh, the reasons that we decided to add it was, I mean, mainly customer demand. Uh, we look at different analytics for what customers want to invest in on our platform. Uh, for example, we were seeing um, unfulfilled searches, so people searching for different things on the platform, um, and. You know, right around that time period, we started to getting we started getting a lot of unfulfilled searches for cryptocurrencies, and, and so we started looking at it. Um, and then uh, also, it became clear that, particularly in that phase of the cryptocurrency market, people were predominantly interested in it as an asset, uh, less so as kind of a, a medium of exchange to power transactions um, and the use case of cryptocurrency as an asset to diversify your holdings um, is is very much in line and was in line with with what Robinhood's core competency was. So uh, we thought we could do something uh, really, really special for customers, make it work very well, and at the same time, sort of fulfill the customer demand. You know, we've been very proud of of the product that we've built. And so how does Robinhood's crypto operation work on the back end? When someone buys Bitcoin or another crypto asset in Robinhood, where are those coins coming from? And then when they sell them, where are they sold? And also, what is your revenue model for the crypto trading? Like, do you just make a little bit of money on the bid ask spread or how does that work? Yeah, it's structured similarly to uh, our equities and, and options business. I mean, different market makers, but it is analogous. So we uh, route customer orders um, through market makers. And then those market makers uh, go and source liquidity through uh, a number of different exchanges and market centers, and uh, and you know we we obtain uh, the coins and sell the coins via them. And the revenue model is is also similar. We collect rebates from our market makers on crypto transactions, kind of similarly to to how it would work in an equities or options transaction. Okay, so it's the payment for order flow model as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, you guys just published a blog post saying that you saw 6 million new crypto users on your platform in just the first two months of 2021 compared to 401,000 in a single month in 2020. Um, however, I'm sure you're well aware, you know, on Twitter, I see it. A lot of people are wondering, you know, why is it that when they buy crypto on Robinhood, can they not withdraw the crypto to their own wallets? When uh, do you think that you'll be able to enable crypto uh, purchasers to move their assets off the platform? Uh, yes, the the wallets question. <laughs> no, I've, uh, I've I've been hearing that one a lot lately. Um, so I guess to the rationale why why we didn't launch with wallets to begin with back in 2018, and it, it was a consideration. Uh, certainly, we were kind of debating internally whether we should hold the launch and give people the ability to transact. Um, or, or put it out there um, without kind of withdrawal and deposit capability. We decided that there actually is a very significant use case, especially for people that aren't 
um, particularly technology savvy and they, they don't understand how, you know, public private keys work um, because, you know, it, it's kind of like using a password manager. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, if you guys use password managers, maybe you do, but if you've tried to explain to someone who is, you know, not a computer scientist or a technical person that they should have their passwords in this thing and have a master passphrase and everything should be sort of uh, buttoned up in that way. Uh, it's the right thing to do. And it's obviously great for security, but you've just dropped the number of people that are going to, that, that are going to kind of um, go through with this by a significant portion. So we were optimizing for making it as easy as possible to do what the majority of people wanted to do, which is to get exposure to these assets uh, with the lowest possible cost. Um, and, and that's really kind of the pillars of Robinhood's product experience. We want to give people the lowest possible cost we can give them. And we also want to have um, the best customer experience. That's just like, it just works. Uh, and so I think we, we've accomplished that. And now um, with the scale and, and load that we're dealing with, we've, uh, we've been staffing the crypto team pretty tremendously and we've committed to doing this. We want to deliver uh, wallets to people and we want to do it as safely and as expeditiously as possible while balancing just sort of the, the demands of a surging business that needs um, high quality customer support, service availability and reliability. Um, so it's uh, we'll, we'll get there, but it's it's not as trivial as sort of like flipping a, a config file and all of these millions of customers can suddenly move their their coins around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, from my understanding of this business, I think also making things fraud proof is, um, you know, really, really important in this kind of scenario. So I'm sure uh, that yeah. may play a role. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've said um, I'm repeatedly Robinhood takes safety extremely seriously. It's our top value. You know, we're a safety first company. And that means not just protecting customers, but making sure that we protect the broader financial system and we work with our regulators and, and other counterparties to, um, to protect the system that their transactions rely upon. Yeah, so we're kind of running out of time, but since we started a bit late, I'm going to take uh, two last questions quickly. Both of you have businesses that are pure crypto and that they involve the selling of the assets themselves. Uh, but you also have uh, these businesses on the securities trading side, which could be potentially disrupted by blockchain technology. So I was curious, just if you were to project out, you know, maybe five years or, or pick your number um, in the future, which business do you think will be a bigger business for each of you? Which business, meaning crypto or uh, stock trading, will be a bigger business for us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as bullish as I am on, on crypto, it's hard for me to imagine that crypto could have the same market cap as U.S. stocks, which I know I think it's like <laughs> forty-five uh, mm -hmm. trillion dollars at the moment, and that's just U.S. stocks. Uh, that's not bonds or you know whatever other types of securities. Um, I think that'll always probably be a bigger asset class um, than crypto. But on the other hand. Um, the, crypto has the possibility to really increase very significantly. And um, it's captured a lot of enthusiasm. And right now the spreads are quite wide on it. So people are making a lot of money on it. I think the whole point of Paxos is we're not trying to pick winners. We're trying to be the infrastructure. And so ultimately if I'm wrong and crypto is the biggest, great. And if, you know, if I'm right and stocks are the biggest, great, because we're working on both of those. And so our goal is we're infrastructure, so we don't have to know exactly which asset's going to be the right one. And um, what I want to make sure is that whoever wants to uh, build a business to serve those end customers has an easy way to do it. And so if we do that successfully, then um, uh, whatever asset class uh, perhaps emerges even that we don't even know, we can also service too. Um, I, I generally agree with that from a sort of direct to consumer uh, business standpoint. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure we're there offering the, the types of investments that customers want to invest in. Uh, I think from a technology standpoint, we are likely to see greater convergence. So, you know, whether you have some of these traditional financial assets um, being tokenized or through uh, through synthetics. There's a lot of really interesting work happening in the synthetic space. Uh, blockchain technology is, is likely going to penetrate the traditional sphere a little bit more. 
Um, and you'll, you'll see some convergence between these two things. So the, if you can't beat them, join them answer. All right. And lastly, what's next for each of your companies? Bloomberg did report that Robinhood has filed to go public, although I'm expecting Vlad is likely not able to discuss this. And Chad, pa PayPal did, um, it, or it was reported that PayPal may be launching a stable coin, which is clearly in Texas's wheelhouse. And you also recently told the block when discussing your $300 million raise that you thought you could add one customer the size of PayPal this year, but now you think you can add three to five. So what can each of you tell us what is next? Uh, tell us about what is next for your companies. Well, um, I'll just say uh, I, I can't talk too much, obviously, about um, any any public offering. Um, but I, I can say that we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, we we want to make sure we continue listening to customers, uh, both crypto and uh, and securities, equities, and options. And uh, we've been growing the team uh, to try to meet all of the demand and make sure we continue to innovate. I think innovation in this space is uh, accelerating and it's going to be increasingly important to kind of meet the demands of, of the people. Yeah. And what I'd say is um, uh, what's driving that growth for us that you were just talking about, Laura, that you mentioned uh, where, you know, maybe we could add one person the size of PayPal and I think we could add three to five is this move from um, early adopter to mainstream. We've been talking about it a lot. And it's happening far faster than I could have imagined. And that's part of the reason why we raised the, the capital is because um, we wanted to use this as a chance uh, to uh, take advantage of the chance here. That is this window of opportunity to really invest in our business, take advantage of what's happening um, with uh, many large firms coming into the space. I'm really surprised at how um, it's really shifted. I think partly because of PayPal um, and and, you know, obviously, you know, Vlad and Robinhood are really early in offering uh, crypto, but uh, PayPal really created, I think, a shift where people were afraid before PayPal and they were afraid after PayPal, uh, just for different reasons. Uh, afraid to be first and now um, afraid that they're going to be left behind. And um, there were obviously early adopters that blazed a trail that got uh, PayPal comfortable. And I think Robinhood is clearly one of those. And um, now that's creating a knock on effect. And um, that knock-on effect is something that we're seeing because of our position as infrastructure. And we're seeing that where firms want to come in and have a turnkey solution to be able to buy and sell crypto, but also, um, you know, be able to send and receive. As Vlad was talking about, you know, that's a complex thing. We do that for uh, customers. And then they also see this as a way to be able to add all kinds of different assets. And ultimately, you have a crypto uh, native asset is really a blockchain native asset. And then you have non-native blockchain assets that we're helping to put into a blockchain world because replatforming the whole system into a blockchain-based world is going to be hugely transformative. I just imagine if every single asset in the world today was sitting on a blockchain, what would the financial system look like? I mean, it's almost hard to like fully do that, that thought experiment. Um, it changes not just issues in the plumbing, which is what we're doing, but issues around exchange, issues around getting loans, issues around um, how people can... Uh, have access to the financial system that they otherwise wouldn't. Um, so there's so much that's going to happen here. And it's exciting to see mainstream companies decide that they want to be part of this ecosystem because that's what attracted me to it 10 years ago. And, you know, I think, you know, we're just still in the first out of the first inning. There's only been $80 billion of assets that have been tokenized. Um, it's basically dollars for crypto trading. Uh, you know, we're, we're barely even started here. Imagine what this will look like when you get to, you know, real real mass adoption. Yeah, I love it that you said that because actually that was going to be a question which I had to leave on the cutting room floor because of time. But I was curious yeah. to get you guys to kind of expound on what that world would look like because I am fascinated by that question. Um, but anyway, thank you both so much again for giving us your great insights. Thank you to everyone who joined our discussion. I think we're going to have to wrap up this really um, scintillating panel. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Vlad and Robinhood and Chad and Paxos, check out the show notes for this episode. Sign up for my newsletter where I will soon be making an announcement about pre-orders from my book, The Cryptopians, Idealism, Greed, Lies, and the Making of the First Big Cryptocurrency Craze. Head to unchainedpodcast.com and the sign up for the email newsletter is right on the homepage. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, and Mark Murdoch. Thanks for listening.